Peekskill, New York is a working class town along the Hudson River, less than an hour north of New York City. With just 25,000 residents, this bedroom community provides a safer environment than the hustle, bustle, and crime of its big city neighbor to the south. As recent immigrants from Colombia, Angela Correa and her family are new to Peekskill, where they live with their stepfather, Pedro, a construction worker. Diana! Oh, una siempre llega tarde. Una buena chica. <laughs> okay, mamá, okay. <laughs> Come on, Angela, first day of school. Don't want to be late. Vamos, apúrate, escucha a tu hermana. School's gonna be fun. Just think of all the cute boys you might meet. Because I was just disruptive. <laughs> so I was one of the first people that Angela met when she came to Peaceville. Mr. Claxton, what is it this time? <laughs> Never mind, Freddie. I don't even want to know. And what can I do for you, young lady? Oh, welcome, Angela. We're glad to have you here in Peekskill. Have you met Mr. Popular, Freddie Claxton? Well, this is Freddy's lucky day. He gets to skip detention today because he's going to get to show you where everything is around here. Sound good? Yes, sir. Freddy, this is Angela. She's new to this country and new to this school. Now, you share first period social studies with her, so you will look after her there and in the hallway because you don't want to find out what will happen if you don't. Do I make myself clear? Yes, sir. All right, Mr. Claxton. Off you go. Sorry, what was your last name again? Correa. Correa. All right, so all the lockers are kind of in alphabetical order. Your locker would probably be like right here, something like that. Angela is more interested in Freddie's eyes than the school tour. And this hallway is mostly like science classes. Or sometimes it doesn't smell too great. It's depending if Mr. Johnson's making stink bombs. <laughs> Come on. Okay, class. Today I would like to discuss what led up to the rise of Nazism in Germany before World War II. Mr. Claxton, I see you found a friend at the principal's office. This is Angela Correa. She just moved to Peekskill. Welcome, Angela. Go grab a seat. You can look on with Freddie until you get your textbooks, okay? Angela Correa was a classmate in two of my classes as a freshman and one as a sophomore. Damn, she's cute, right? You know, I thought then she was pretty. A little over a year later, Angela has settled in well and made a good friend in Ruthie Vega. Hey, beautiful. You all set for the party at the pit tonight? It's gonna be killer. My friend's hooking us up with beer. Yeah, I can't wait. I'll meet you after dinner. I told my parents I'm staying over Angela's because she's such a good girl. Angela was quiet. She was not the 
outgoing, partying type of girl. Cool. See you later. Thanks, Angela. Really so cute. You are lucky. Our high school is small, so you didn't know who was running around, who was doing what with who, you know. The pit was known as a place to hang out, drink beer, and make out without getting caught. I never hung out there. I never got to hang out there. <laughs> That's just amazing. <laughs> Freddy was popular and he was cool, so in some ways in the high school he was the opposite of me. That might be the cops, so turn the music down. You're paranoid, man. There's nobody out there. It's a loser. <clears throat> There's a guy that uh, stays in the woods. Well, maybe it's X-Man Tom. Don't say that. It gives me the creeps. X-Man Tom. Really weird guy. No one knows him. So that's what makes it even more weird. No one ever seen him outside of Hillcrest Park. But we see him in the woods. Chasing girls. Yeah, any boyfriends? Hey. Hey. Night girls. Oh yeah, do you remember the swimming tomorrow? My friend has a pool and we should totally check it out. Yeah, okay. sister. Angela's so cute. I had a serious crush on her. You think if I write her a note, you can pass it to her in school for me? Sure, John, no problem. I'll give her your note. Jeff in school he wasn't very social. He wasn't very popular. you and he wanted me to give you this note. Uh, uh, I, I'm already late for photography. A 
On November 15, 1989, Angela heads out after school to fulfill a nature photo assignment. It's not like Angela to miss dinner. Where could she be? Go take a drive. Go look for her in the neighborhood. She's fine. She's gonna turn up. Ben, buscala, por favor. All right. Call around to see if anyone knows where she is, okay? See, see. <laughs> Hello? Ruthie, hey, have you seen Angela? She didn't come home for dinner. No? Well, let me know if you hear of anything, okay? Hello? Yes, I would like to report on a missing person. Her name is Angela Correa. She's 15 years old. Attention, everyone. I have a very important announcement. A student of ours has been reported missing. Uh, her name is Angela Correa. If anyone has any information about Angela's whereabouts, please report to the principal's office immediately. Where where would she be? Like, if she's missing, is that, is that important that it's announced? In the fall of 1989, the search for 15-year-old Angela Correa is in full force. She has been missing from her Peekskill, New York home for two days now. Canine units pick up her scent in nearby Hillcrest Park. We got a body in Hillcrest Park, a young female. Seems to be our missing person. They find Angela's body beneath leaves and twigs, just yards away from the pit, known as a teen hangout for bonfires and partying. Things like that didn't happen in Peacekill. And to know what happened to someone like Angela, someone so quiet and so close, in my own backyard was was eerie. Angela's partially clothed body is discovered lying on her back and appears to have been dragged to that spot. Forensic examination reveals signs of strangulation, sexual assault, and blunt force trauma to the back of the young girl's head.
These are most likely drag marks. This was the last place, then where did it start? Investigators survey the wider area to try and figure out what happened and where. Detectives believe Angela was likely surprised on the path while she was preoccupied with her photography. <laughs> Angela's Walkman and camera are recovered, but not her keys, and none of her photos reveal a glimpse of the killer. He most likely would have abducted her here, and then it's very probable that he pulled her through this way. That looks about right. Yeah. And maybe this where he raped and killed her. <laughs> These are drag marks. Yeah, to take her down through that way. It appears the perp dragged her body to the pit face down based on the scrapes found on Angela's face and left her on the forest floor. They also recover a few stray hairs, as well as semen, which can be used for a DNA comparison to possible suspects. What's that? Uh, it looks like a note. Oh, uh, it's wet. It's probably been on the body about two days. Maybe in a day or two when it dries out, we can read it. Nearby residents tell police that drug users and homeless men often hang out in the park. One regular has been dubbed Axe Man Tom by the teens who hang out at the pit. Perhaps Angela crossed paths with him. Axe Man Tom. He used to stay in the woods, and sometimes we'd see him with his own six-pack. He never speaks to us, and uh, we never speak to him. No one knows who this guy is, but that's what we labeled him. Axeman Tom. But police find no sign of Axeman Tom or any other vagrants in the park. Still, a man who lives across the street claims he noticed suspicious activity around the time Angela was killed. He saw two Hispanic men, dressed like construction workers, driving in a dark sedan. To detectives, one of the men sounds like he could be Angela's stepfather, Pedro Rivera, who is Hispanic, a construction foreman, and also drives a dark sedan. Now, police wonder if Angela's stepfather may have somehow been involved in the murder of his wife's youngest child. It's been three days since 15-year-old Angela Correa was found sexually assaulted and strangled to death in a park near her Peekskill, New York home. Police have concluded that Angela's stepfather, Pedro Rivera, may be a person of interest after a witness reports that a man fitting Pedro's description and his vehicle were at the park on the day of the murder.
But when investigators confirmed that Pedro went to work and then came straight home to his wife on the day his stepdaughter disappeared, he is cleared of suspicion. To narrow their search for suspects, Peekskill police turned to the NYPD's profiling unit for help. By analyzing the victim's age, background, and crime scene, a profiler aims to predict likely traits of a suspect. For Angela's killer, the profiler concludes it's likely a white or Hispanic male, a teenager who's a loner, insecure around women, but who knew Angela. The profile also states the killer is probably prone to violent outbursts and may use drugs or alcohol. People couldn't believe it. You know, girls more, more or less were afraid the killer's still out there. And if it could be Angela, it could be anybody. Meanwhile, Peekskill investigators try to decipher the fragment of a wet letter found under Angela's body. It's dry. It's dated the same date as the murder. What's it say? Dear Freddie, I can't take it. And then the ink is smudged. Heavy eyes, they kill me. Freddie's a boyfriend? Maybe. This arrest is too smudged to make any sense. I'll call Angela's sister Diana and see if she knows who this Freddie guy is. Police learn that the Freddie referenced on the letter is probably Freddie Claxton, Angela's classmate, and she had a serious crush on him. He has these bright eyes that kind of jump out at you. You ever written any uh, love letters, Mr. Claxon? Sure. Of course I have. A high school student doesn't write love letters, and uh, they said, do you write love letters to Angela Correa? No, I've never written a love letter to Angela Corey in my life. Really? I, I, was, I was definitely sure that I didn't, you know, I wouldn't forget that I wrote a love letter to someone. And uh, they said, well, does she write love letters to you? And at that point, I... I just was completely uncomfortable. I knew something wasn't right, and uh, I told them no. She doesn't write love letters to me. You see, that's odd, because we have love letters from her to you. That is odd, because I've never received it. Finally, they whispered a little bit, and uh, I'm pretty sure it was about my father who was on the other side of the door going crazy. And, and then let me go. All right. One more question, Mr. Claxton, then you're free to go. Where were you from 3 to 4 p.m.? the night that Angela was killed. I was playing basketball after school with three other friends. Okay. You're free to go. We'll be in touch. Okay. Police confirm Freddy's alibi. He is ruled out as the killer. Two days after Angela Correa's body was recovered, the family holds a wake, which hundreds attend.
police are also present. Since their profiler predicts that the murderer knew Angela, it's likely he's among her mourners. <laughs> Jeffrey Deskovic stood out. He attended all four sessions of the wake. He was uh, crying uncontrollably. <laughs> Angela's parents did not know who this boy was. Um, who was acting this way at the funeral. So he came to the police's attention at that point. It was fairly emotional for myself as well as many, many other people because um, that was really my first thing brushed with death. And again, she was, uh, she was so young and it was somebody that I knew. They can seem really upset. Was he like uh, Angela's boyfriend or something? Who, oh, Jeff Deskovic? He wishes. I mean, he always had the biggest crush on Angela, but she would never give him the time of day. Really? He certainly seemed like a sensitive guy. Weird is more like it. I mean, he's always um, kind of a loner. Because I was quiet into myself in high school, I seem strange to the kids in the school. The awkward teen seems to fit the police's profile. Could Jeffrey Deskovic be Angela's killer? While attending 15-year-old Angela Correa's funeral in 1989, Peekskill, New York police are careful to notice if anyone fits their profile of her killer. Jeffrey Deskovic sticks out like a sore thumb. By all accounts, he is an insecure loner, and his over-the-top behavior at the wake only arouses more suspicion. Next thing you know, I hear that Jeff is crying hysterically over Angela's death. It seemed like people were more disturbed over that than the funeral. <laughs> Jeffrey was acting strangely after the murder. He slipped a note into the girl's coffin. <laughs> The note is retrieved prior to burial. One of Jeffrey's friends who saw the letter tells police about it. To investigators, it appears Jeffrey may be exhibiting murderer's remorse, attending every day of Angela's wake, as well as her funeral. Police also learn from Jeffrey's downstairs neighbor that he is prone to violent outbursts with his single mother. Jeffrey! Jeffrey! Jeffrey, dinner's ready. Stop interrupting me! Jeffrey, I'm sure whatever you're doing can wait. I just stop interrupting me! Jeffrey fits the police profile like a glove. Teenage loner, known to the victim, prone to violence. Could Jeff Deskovic be Angela's killer? Or is Jeffrey just a troubled 16-year-old experiencing the death of a peer for the first time? appear to whom he was attracted to find out detectives want to talk to jeffrey in person that's him there he is 
right, Jeff. I'm Detective McIntyre. This is my partner, Detective Levine. We were wondering if you could come down to the station with us to talk about Angela's death. We can call your mom to make sure it's okay. No. Don't call her. I'd rather you didn't. I can come with you, but I don't know how I can help. We're interviewing everyone who knew Angela. Were you guys close? No. We had a few classes together, but that's it. Well, you sure seem pretty broken up over a death for someone who wasn't close to her. Well, if all you guys got is my strange behavior, then you haven't gotten much. Well, maybe you can help us out. Police believe Jeffrey knows more than he's telling, and the fatherless teen is enjoying their interest. Growing up in a single-parent household, I enjoyed the attention. I enjoyed feeling important. Over the next three weeks, Jeffrey talks to detectives a half dozen more times and even asks them to join him at the crime scene to tell them his theory of what happened. So the way I figured it, Angela must have walked right down this path. She would have been preoccupied by her camera or her ears covered by her earphones. And then if she stopped right here, it would have been the perfect place for someone in the woods here or by that bench to see her approach. So. I figured she would snatch right here, and and then I, I bet she dropped her camera right here. Uh-huh. In my mind, I was focused on the aspect of being like a junior detective and, you know, buying into the idea on their end that uh, I could help them solve the crime. Then what happened? And then I figure he dragged her into the woods and raped her over there. And leaves her there? No, no, too risky. He must have dragged her to the pit after she was passed out or dead. Impressive. <laughs> How'd you figure all this out? Good investigative work, I guess. Good work, Jeff. My fantasy childhood career was to be a police officer, so I enjoyed this early, unexpected opportunity to do this quasi-police work. Oh, I almost forgot. I found this here. I heard Angela lost her keys, uh, so I assumed it was one of hers. That set off alarm bells with the police. Good job, Jeff. We would love to confirm all this with a polygraph and a blood test so we can eliminate you altogether. Sure. Anything to help. Great. Jeffrey could just be a lonely young man who is genuinely conducting his own investigation to gain acceptance by the police. Or Deskovic's actions might also be those of a killer, inserting himself into the investigation and working up the gumption to confess. After Jeffrey signs a waiver and has his blood drawn, detectives ready him for his polygraph test. The police were able to interview me without the permission of my mother because in New York, if you're 16 years old and you're considered to be an adult, they suddenly did not need her permission to take a blood sample from me. I'm just gonna ask you a series of questions and I just need you to answer as honestly and completely as you're able to. You understand? Yes, sir. Is your name Jeffrey Mark Deskovic? Yes. And do you live in apartment 1A at 11th Street in Peekskill, New York? Yes. And do you have a full-time job? No, I do not. I'm a student at Peekskill High School.
test results show deception. May have you kill him. Jeffrey Deskovic fails the test. But that's not hard evidence. In order to prosecute him for Angela's death, detectives will have to get him to confess. On January 25th, 1990, just over two months after 15-year-old Angela Correa was found sexually assaulted and strangled to death, her classmate, 16-year-old Jeffrey Deskovic, the prime suspect, has just failed his polygraph. I didn't do good on the test. No, Jeffrey, you didn't. Are you hungry? Do you want some food? Go get him a burger. Do you have something you want to tell me? What do you mean? It's obvious you killed Angel. What? No, I didn't. You showed deception. McIntyre advised Eskovic that it had become evident to me several weeks ago that he, Jeff Deskovic, was responsible for Angela Correa's death. And the only way someone could have known all those details of that murder is if they were the killer. That's not true. But what I don't understand is why you keep pretending that you're helping us and that you didn't do it. You and I both know you did it. When he said that to me, that really shot my fear through the roof. He added that if I did as they wanted, that not only would they stop what they were doing, but that I could go home afterwards. Deskovic can't take the pressure and bizarrely starts referring to himself in the third person. He... I didn't... It was about three weeks ago when he realized he may be responsible. Sometimes he hears voices when no one else is around. Deskovic then said, when I started coming in, I thought I was helping to get this guy at first, I didn't realize the guy was me. I just had to be sure before I told you. Being young, naive, frightened, uh, 16 years old, I was totally overwhelmed psychologically and emotionally and just wanting to get out of there. I uh, took the out which they offered and I made up a story based upon uh, uh, information which they had given me in the course of their uh, interrogation. I could tell you exactly how he responded. I want to read it verbatim. I don't want to paraphrase it. Deskovic began talking as, quote, the guy caught up to Angela on the path. He said, hello. Jeffrey? The guy said, don't see another guy. Angela responded, don't tell me what to do. Deskovic then continued, quote, I lost my temper. Ah! Jeffrey, what are you doing? Stop! She started to walk away, so I tackled her. And then I grabbed her around the throat and then put my hand over her mouth. I may have done it too long. I ripped off her bra. 
the uh, confession was a combination of information which the police had given me both that day and, and in the six weeks prior to that, uh, things I read in the newspaper, uh, rumors and, you know, my own theories that the police continued to ask me to come up with and who then congratulated me on. <laughs> By the end of the interrogation, I was on the floor. I was in the fetal position, and I was crying uncontrollably. Come on, I need you to get up. Come on, get up. <laughs> Jeffrey Deskovic, you have the right to remain silent. You have the right to an attorney. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed to you. Do you understand your rights, Jeffrey? Jeffrey Deskovic is charged with rape and murder. But when his blood is compared to the DNA from the semen sample found on Angela's body, it does not match. In addition to the DNA not matching me, there was also um, hair found on the body, including uh, a Negroid hair, um, which uh, also did not match me. The forensics point to a different suspect and Deskovic recants his confession. People were asking him, why would you ever confess to a crime you didn't commit? And he just looked up and he said, because I just wanted it to end. And I think that's what happens. I mean, I work on a lot of cases where this kind of thing has happened. Despite the conflicting DNA evidence, a Westchester County jury finds 17-year-old Jeffrey Deskovic guilty based on his detailed confession i couldn't believe my ears when they said guilty i mean i was questioning whether i was even hearing correctly i mean in my way of thinking at least up until that point in time only guilty people were convicted the judge sentences the teenager as an adult to elmira correctional facility in upstate new york by now, I'm 17 years old, and the judge had told me that I'm gonna have to go to prison for a minimum of 15 years with a maximum of uh, life. I was uh, emotionally distraught, I was frightened, I was uh, confused, my head felt like it was spinning, and I didn't know what to expect next. Over the next 16 years, Jeffrey Deskovic files seven appeals. All are denied. Then, in 1996, technology advances. New York Governor George Pataki signs into law the creation of the CODIS DNA data bank. Now, samples can be tested against all DNA profiles that have been entered nationwide. The CODIS system is a database system where they can go in with evidence they have and see when they already have a DNA profile, they can see whether there's any kind of a match. They took the crime scene DNA evidence, which already didn't match me, and they compared it to the DNA data bank, and it matched the actual perpetrator. Stephen Cunningham, a 47-year-old convict who is already serving a sentence for the murder of his girlfriend's sister, matches the DNA found on Angela Correa's body. 16 years prior. Left free while I was doing time for his crime, he committed an unrelated murder, killing a mother of two. It was a big deal. You know, he, he blamed it all on his addiction to crack. How did you end up killing him? Hmm. Strangling. Was it during the sex? Was it after the sex? Uh, yeah, it was during and like a rage. What was it? What did she do? I mean, talk about the cocaine makes you aggressive, but what did she do that put you into that rage? No, nothing at all.
he basically said that the, the crack made him decide, you know, to have sex with her, and that he, he had blocked out whether she was screaming, whether she told him to stop. On November 2nd, 2006, after serving 16 and a half years for a crime he didn't commit, Jeffrey Daskovic emerges a free man. The day I walked out of court and I was free, it was kind of a sur surreal moment. I mean, I remember that the sun was out, it was a blue sky, there weren't any clouds to be seen, and it felt like it wasn't quite real to me. I thought that this day would never uh, uh, get there. I found meaning in doing uh, advocacy work on um, wrongful conviction causes and the reforms needed to prevent them. I decided after the uh, first week of being out that I didn't want to be an angry or bitter person. Deskovic settles several lawsuits for $19 million and uses the money to establish a nonprofit foundation to help free others falsely convicted. Jeff was very moved to have a few minutes uh, to speak with uh, Angela Correa's mother after both of them were crying. She had written a lengthy victim impact statement. There are so many amazing things I had saved in my heart that helped me to continue living without her. She had the most beautiful soul. She was kind, sweet, and had the biggest heart you have ever seen. 